We all know that vertebrates have a complex circulatory system composed of a heart and blood vessels. This is a dynamic system that allows animals to supply their internal organs with oxygen and nutrients while removing carbon dioxide and other waste products. Having a circulatory system enables organisms to overcome the limitations that diffusion places on size and metabolic rate. You can get some pretty large animals that don't have circulatory systems, like jellyfish and flatworms, but they tend to be limited to a flat body shape that doesn't move very fast. So if lots of animals have circulatory systems, what do they look like and how do they work? In this video we're going to take a look at some circulatory systems and blood vessels in a range of invertebrates including earthworms, snails, scorpions and insects covering the phyla of Annelida, Mollusca and Arthropoda. As usual you can access digital copies of all the microscope slides used in this video via the website at www.downthescope.co.uk. You can also donate to the project. This helps me buy or produce more slides to put up and discuss. I've set up an attribution system so you'll know which slide was bought with your donation. Let's start with the earthworms. You'll often hear that earthworms have five hearts. Of course, this is a little bit misleading. There is a grain of truth in this, though. Earthworms have two large vessels, the dorsal and ventral vessels. They're connected in each segment by smaller commissural vessels that run in the body wall. In five segments near the worm's head, these commissural vessels are enlarged and known as the aortic arches, or the pseudo-hearts. These structures contain valves that ensure blood flows in one direction, kind of like our heart. So an earthworm has five pairs of contractile blood vessels, which I guess might count as ten hearts. But the aortic arches aren't the only blood vessels capable of contracting. The dorsal vessel is also contractile and pulses at a rate of about 11 beats per minute, although this is temperature dependent. Earthworms have a closed circulatory system, which means that their blood never leaves the vessels. If we look at a section of earthworm skin, we can see the red stained blood contained within blood vessels that loop up close to the surface where they will exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen with the environment, fulfilling the function of lungs. The blood vessels in earthworms are not lined by endothelium. Instead, the blood has direct contact with the contractile cells that form the vessel wall, known as the myoepithelium. Sometimes cells known as amoebocytes will attach to the vessel wall. Some scientists have argued that these are the precursors of endothelial cells in vertebrates. You can see that the blood in earthworms is red just like ours. This is because they use the same oxygen-carrying molecule, haemoglobin. However, earthworm haemoglobin, also called erythrocruorin, is a far bigger molecule coming in at about 3 million daltons in size compared to 64,000 daltons for mammalian haemoglobin. Other animals don't have closed circulatory systems like vertebrates and earthworms. Instead, blood is circulated by a heart-like contractile organ. There are blood vessels that carry the blood to important organs like the lungs, brain or limbs, but these eventually open out into the body cavity where the blood is free to bathe cells directly without the barrier formed by blood vessels. For example, in scorpions, the blood collects in the ventral part of the body called the ventral sinus. From there it passes through the book lungs where it's oxygenated before being returned to the pericardial sinus in pulmonary veins. This system is particularly clear in a couple of sections of scorpions on the website. The contractile organ is called the dorsal aorta. It's a long tubular structure suspended in the pericardial sinus by seven pairs of thin strap-like muscles called the alary muscles. There are some subtle structural features that help the dorsal aorta fulfil its function of pumping blood around. Periodically, along the dorsal aorta, there are a series of holes called ostia. These are guarded by valves. When the dorsal aorta relaxes, the valves open, allowing blood to enter the lumen. On contraction, the valves close to prevent backflow of blood, similar to the valves in the hearts of vertebrates. Contraction causes tension in alary muscles, suspending the dorsal aorta, which will contract and help the dorsal aorta expand again to fill with blood. Studies of the blood vessels in scorpions show vessels emanating from both the front and back ends of the dorsal aorta, which go on to supply important structures like the brain and limbs. The muscle cells forming the dorsal aorta are not able to generate action potentials, like some heart muscle cells in vertebrates. Instead, scorpions have a cardiac ganglion, a collection of nerve cells that control the heart rate and location where the wave of contraction begins along the dorsal aorta. Usually, the start of contraction is further back in the heart, meaning that most blood gets pumped towards the brain and legs. 
Additionally, the wave of contraction is strongest at the back end of the heart, further facilitating blood flow forwards. Some research suggests that the location of the pacemaker region in the heart can change, allowing the scorpion to control blood flow to other organs such as the digestive tract. You'll notice that scorpions have cells within their blood. These are hemocytes that form part of the immune system. So far, six different types of hemocyte have been characterised in scorpions based on their morphology. Some of them will be phagocytes capable of engulfing bacteria or other foreign material, while other hemocytes play a role in blood coagulation in the event of injury. The blood vessels themselves are simple structures. Their walls are relatively thin compared to the earthworm, and you'll notice that they don't have an endothelial lining either. Usually the blood vessels can be identified by the greyish content that looks similar to the content of the heart, like these ones around the brain. In the limbs, the blood vessels run alongside the nerves, making them easier to identify. Insects have a similar heart structure to scorpions in that the heart is formed by a tube of contractile cells suspended along the dorsal aspect of the body, with ostia to allow blood to enter. Despite having various sections of insects, including sawfly, larvae, fleas and houseflies, I haven't yet managed to get a good section that shows an insect heart. Nor do these sections have any blood vessels. All I have is video of an insect larvae I found in some pond water. You can see a pulsing tube, which is the heart. There are also valves that ensure one-way flow. Just as in scorpions, the heart will pump blood into the body cavity, the haemocele. This doesn't provide enough pressure to get the blood into the appendages, such as legs and antennae. We saw that scorpions had blood vessels to carry blood to their legs. Insects don't have that adaptation. Instead, they have what are known as accessory pulsatile organs. This diagram shows the open leg of an insect. The haemocele is divided into two cavities by a diaphragm which includes a valve flap. A contractory muscle around the diaphragm pulsates to keep blood moving around in the leg. The diaphragm separates afferent from efferent blood, ensuring a more or less unidirectional flow of blood in the leg. Another unique feature of some insects is the reverse heartbeat. This means that the heart can beat in the reverse direction and withdraw blood from different body cavities. In insects, the blood doesn't have a role in oxygen transportation. Instead, air is supplied directly to the organs in a system of tubes known as tracheals. We can see these tubes quite clearly in lots of different sections of insects, and they can be confused with blood vessels because they're fulfilling a similar function in terms of gas exchange. Some mollusks, like snails, also have an open circulatory system. The blood drains into large veins which empty into the paleal cavity leading to the oracle. This is the first chamber of the heart which pumps blood into the ventricle. Actually, the heart looks remarkably similar in structure to vertebrates in that there are valves between the ventricle and oracle, as well as muscular trabeculae. Of course, the heart is in a completely different place, being right next to the kidney, and also has a few unique functions such as specialised areas for filtering the blood. You can check out my video on snail kidney function if you're interested in more detail. The ventricle pumps blood into arteries which branch into smaller and smaller vessels that eventually empty into the haemocele so blood can bathe the organs. The blood vessels in snails have thicker muscular walls similar to those of the earthworm. Again there's no endothelium so the blood is in direct contact with the muscle. The heart rate is under control of the central nervous system. One interesting feature of the central nervous system of snails is that the ganglia contain giant neurons which, as the name suggests, are these massive neurons just here. Apart from their size, the striking thing about these neurons is that they are reliably in the same place in all central nervous systems of closely related snails. This means that biologists can track their function. I'm not skilled enough to be able to tell you which giant neurons these are or even which ganglia they belong to, but I'm reliably informed that certain giant neurons such as PON, the periodically oscillating neuron, or the three TANs, the tonically autoactive neurons, have excitatory or inhibitory effects on the heart muscle of snails. Finally, I just want to point out the main difference between invertebrate and vertebrate blood vessels. You'll have seen some similarities between our own and other animal circulatory systems in this video. Usually there's a pumping mechanism, sometimes attached to progressively smaller blood vessels that take blood to the tissue. But there is one unique cell type in the vertebrate circulatory system, the much overlooked endothelial cells. 
These little chaps lie in our circulatory systems, acting as gatekeepers and deciding what can or can't make it from the blood into our tissues. They also recruit white blood cells during inflammation, modulate blood clotting and determine the formation of new blood vessels. So all around, a very useful thing to have evolved. That's all for now, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you want to know more about vertebrate blood vessel structure or how to identify them on histology slides, you can check out this other video I made. Thanks for watching, and until next time, goodbye.